Well, this is one of the most important classes in the entire business management course, because the main idea of this class is where to get money and how to use it right. There are three parts in this class – internal sources of finance, external sources of finance, and short-term and long-term sources of finance. And we have three assessment objectives that correspond to these three parts – to analyze internal sources of finance, to analyze external sources of finance, and to justify the appropriateness of short-term or long-term sources of finance for a given situation. The first two assessment objectives are AO2, which means that we are learning to explain internal and external sources of finance, and the last assessment objective is AO3, evaluation, which means that we are learning to discuss, justify, suggest the most appropriate source of finance in a given situation. If you guys watched my video classes before, then you know that I'm trying not only to talk about stuff, I'm also trying to encourage you to do something and take notes in a systematic manner so that you understand different stuff that relates to business better. This class is no exception and I'm going to ask you to fill in this table. I will be talking about three different types of internal sources of finance. Things that I'll discuss is what these sources of finance mean, what are their advantages and disadvantages, and in what kind of situations the given source of finance works well, or for what kind of situation the source of finance is appropriate for. So please make notes using this table and let's talk about personal funds, first of all. Personal funds are just savings that you have or some money that your friends or family give to you. Maybe for free or maybe as a loan, doesn't matter. Basically, personal savings is the same as personal funds. On the one hand, this source of finance is free. It means you don't have to pay a fee to acquire this source of finance and there is no interest rate. You just use your own money, you have full control over this money, you are free to do whatever you want. However, on the other hand, these personal savings are usually insufficient. And in addition to that, if your business idea does not turn out to be very successful, then you will end up losing all your personal savings. And if you have wife and kids and other responsibilities, then it's quite risky. So, if you ask me, in what kind of situations does this source of finance work well, I would say it works very well for unlimited liability businesses, such as sole traders, and partnerships. If you forgot what limited unlimited liability is, then you got to review 1.2 types of business entities. The second internal source of finance is called retained profits. So if you run a business and your business is making some profits, it means that the difference between revenues and costs is positive, your business actually gets to retain, to keep some profits, then that would be retained profits. It's not your personal funds, it's something that your business generates. But it's up to you as an entrepreneur or manager to decide how to spend these retained profits. On the one hand, retained profits is also a free source of finance in a sense that you don't have to pay interest rate or pay a fee in order to obtain this source of finance. In addition, you have full control over how you want to spend this money. On the other hand, if we are talking about new businesses, then there are no retained profits, there is nothing to retain, so it would be completely inapplicable to startups. In addition to that, if you decide to retain profits and you're a company and you are doing that at an expense of not paying dividends to your shareholders, then you might get the owners of the company, shareholders, really unhappy. And lastly, if your business is really small, then retained profits might also be quite insufficient to fund, sustain your operations. Thus, based on these pros and cons of retained profits, we might say that it is quite a suitable source of finance for companies that can retain sufficient amounts of money without making their shareholders unhappy. If you are this kind of a business, then retained profits might work well for you. The last internal source of finance is called sale of assets. This is kind of self-explanatory. It means that if your business has some assets, for example, machines or land or equipment or buildings, uh, then you can sell them in order to get some cash inflows. 
On the one hand, again, same as with most so internal sources of finance, this source of finance is free, you don't have to pay any interest rate, and you get to control the money that you raise through sale of assets completely. You don't have to run it by the bank, there are no agreements made, you have full control over how to spend this money, if you are a manager or entrepreneur. However, usually businesses sell some insignificant assets that do not jeopardize the operations and thus they are not able to raise too much money through that. And in addition to that, if you have ever tried to sell something online to another person, you must know that it takes quite a long time to find the right buyer, to negotiate the price, to show the assets and etc. etc. So on the other hand, sale of assets is a little bit time consuming. But if your business is just about to relocate or shut down some of its parts and you actually have to sell assets anyway, then it might be a great source of finance. This way, if you are relocating or shutting down some of your divisions anyway, you will have to sell assets anyway, so why not raise some cash through it? That's it, there are only three internal sources of finance, which are personal funds, retained profits, and sale of assets. I hope that you took notes in a systematic manner and filled in this table. In the next part of class, we'll talk about external sources of finance. If you watched the first part of this class, then you guys remember that I asked you to fill in a table while you were listening to what I'm saying. In this class, we're going to do exactly the same thing, but we're not talking about internal sources of finance, we're talking about external sources of finance, which are sources of finance that come from outside the organization. We'll talk about eight external sources of finance. Share capital, loan capital, overdrafts, trade credit, crowdfunding, leasing, microfinance providers, and business angels. And in the end of this part of class, I'm going to share some additional external sources of finance that are not, for some reason, included in business management course of the IB. So listen to what I'm saying, fill in the table, make sure you understand what the source of finance means, what are its pros and cons, and what is the situation in which this source of finance can work well. Let's go! Share capital refers to money that is raised through sale of shares. This can refer to companies, either privately held companies or publicly held companies. On the one hand, if you sell shares, you can raise quite large sums of money, especially if we are talking about IPO and about publicly held companies. In addition to that, there is no fee or interest to pay, you just sell shares and you get investment in return. On the other hand, since companies have limited liability, this comes with a lot of bureaucracy, because government wants to make sure that there is no fraud, that everything is legal, that investors are not at risk of losing their money. So this is quite a bureaucratic procedure. In addition to that, you can potentially lose control if you sell too much shares, if you sell too much ownership of your company to other people. This is basically what happened to Steve Jobs, because other people got more shares and they actually fired Steve Jobs from the company that he created. And this is something that did not happen to Mark Zuckerberg, because he retained most of the shares for himself, so he is the majority shareholder and people cannot kick him out of his own company, even though some of them would really like to do that, I think. And in addition to that, even though there is no interest and fee, you need to pay dividends every once in a while to your shareholders to make sure they want to hold on to their shares and not sell them, thus decreasing the market capitalization of your company. So in what kind of situation does share capital work best? It works best for limited liability organizations, which are companies, either privately held or publicly held, especially if share capital does not result in loss of control. So if share capital is money that you raise through selling some of the ownership over your company to other people or organizations, then loan capital is something that is not related to ownership at all. You just go to the bank or another 
another financial lender and ask them for some money in exchange for fee and interest payments. The clear advantage of this source of finance is that there is no loss of control. You need money, you borrow money, then you pay back. It has nothing to do with shares, with ownership and with control. On the other hand, nobody's gonna lend you money for free. You will have to repay. So there is interest payment that comes with all the loans. Interest rate is the percentage that is added on top of the loan that you are supposed to return to the lender. In addition to that, sometimes when you take a loan, you should provide a collateral. Collateral usually is either property that belongs to your business or to you personally, or a person or organization that can agree to pay back your loan in case you cannot. So some banks, some lenders are not willing to provide loans if there is no collateral, if there is no guarantee that your payment will be taken care of in case you are not able to do that. So having to find this collateral or having to give away some of your property if you are not able to repay the loan is clearly a disadvantage of this source of finance. So in what kind of situation it works best? It works best when you need a, quite a large sum of money that you can repay over a long term usually and when you do not want to lose any control and when you are quite sure that you can pay back. There are a lot of kinds of loans, so one thing that you might want to explore further is debentures and mortgages. These are not included in business management course, but if you're interested, leave a comment below and I can record a video class with some extra sources of finance. Also, in the end of this class, I will give you a full list of other external sources of finance that you might want to explore, so please stay tuned. The next source of finance is called overdrafts. Overdrafts is an agreement with a bank when you can use money that you don't have. Let me give you an example. So let's say you run a business. Your business, of course, has a bank account. In this bank account, when you reach zero, usually it means that you cannot buy anything because you've reached zero. Your balance is zero. You can't buy anything. But if you have a good credit history or if the bank is just offering this service, you can use overdraft. You can go down to minus 10,000 US dollars or 20,000 US dollars or minus a few million dollars. It depends on the agreement with the bank. Even though you reach zero, you can use more money. That's the whole point of overdraft. But everything is not that simple. You have to repay this money quite soon. And if you don't manage to refill, top up your bank account, then the interest rate is going to be much higher than for traditional loans. So overdraft is basically a great source of finance when you need some cash urgently that you can return in a very short time. Now let me summarize. Overdraft is taking more money than you have in your bank account. On the one hand, it's really easy to acquire. You don't need a collateral, you don't need any paperwork. Usually it's automatic, you can just do it in the app. On the other hand, the interest rates are really high and you really don't want to have your payment overdue when it comes to overdrafts. And it works best when you have minor cash flow problems. For example, let's say you produce chairs and usually you make 100 chairs a month. Then some school approaches you and tells, hey, we need 1000 chairs. And you were like, wow, great. This is a great order. I will make a lot of money, but you don't have enough money to buy wood. However, once you sign this deal with that school, you know that they will pay you back. So you can apply for an overdraft in your bank, you can buy all the wood that you need, even though you don't have money for it, and then once you get payment from your customer, once you provide 1000 shares, you will be able to top up your bank account, you will make a lot of money and you will pay back for overdraft. So this is the kind of situation when overdraft works well. Trade credit. The way trade credit works is buy now, pay later. Trade credit is a relationship between creditor and debtor. Creditor is your supplier that gives you some raw materials or components and debtor is you, the person who buys stuff from your supplier and promises to pay back for the supply later, within the credit period. Credit period is the time period within which you are supposed to pay back to your supplier, to your creditor. For instance, if we continue the example with chair manufacturing, you produce chairs and you have a supplier of wood. 
so you can get some wood from your supplier today, but pay back to your supplier in one month. Credit period is usually one or two months, sometimes it's three months, it all depends on the industry and it all depends on the relationship between creditor and debtor, between the business and its suppliers. The advantage of it is obvious, you don't have to pay even though you can get your supply. On the other hand, if you are not willing to pay right now, then you will end up paying more. If you offer your supplier to pay at the time of purchase, then probably your supplier will give you a discount. But if you want to pay at a later date, there is definitely not no discount, you will pay full price or higher price. Trade credit works well when the relationship with your supplier, with your creditor, is really good. When you can come to a solution that works best for you and your creditor. Crowdfunding is, just think about it, crowdfunding. This is when a crowd of people, a lot of people, make small donations and this way you raise money to kickstart your business. So crowdfunding refers to obtaining small sums of money from many people, usually with the help of crowdfunding platforms, for example Indiegogo and Kickstarter. I will leave the links to these websites below, please feel free to click them and explore what crowdfunding is. On the one hand, crowdfunding is free, you just register on the website and go, post your stuff there. In addition to that, you get access to people who use crowdfunding websites all the time, so it's a community of people who are happy to donate money to businesses that they like and that they want to support. There is no issue of loss of control as in the case with share capital. You just obtain money, you don't have to give ownership over your company to anyone. These are just donations. And in addition to that, by raising money through crowdfunding platforms, you can get direct feedback. You can see how fast people are donating or not donating, and thus you can see how feasible your business idea is. If people are donating, then it's working well. If they're not, then maybe you have to go back and change something about your business idea. On the other hand, there are three disadvantages. First of all, even though you don't have to pay for posting your crowdfunding campaign on crowdfunding platform, they usually charge commission. So whatever money you raise, you will have to pay 5, 10, 15 or whatever percent to the crowdfunding platform for providing this space for you. In addition to that, crowdfunding platforms have a lot of rules that you will have to comply with. So maybe your business idea is not something that you can actually post on crowdfunding platforms. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, crowdfunding platforms are a community of businesses and donors, so competition there is pretty high. So you have to come up with an idea that stands out in order to get donors' attention. So crowdfunding works best if you have a brilliant idea and if you are a small business that needs access to finance. The next source of finance is leasing. In leasing, the relationship is between the lesser and lessee. So if you are a manager or entrepreneur who runs a business, then you are the lessee, you lease something from the lesser. For example, if you run a pizza restaurant and you want to offer delivery to your customers, but you don't have enough money to buy a delivery truck, then you can lease this delivery truck from another company. This way you will not have to buy it, you will just pay monthly or yearly for the usage of this truck. On the one hand, there are no maintenance costs. Since you are not the owner of that delivery truck, you don't have to take care of maintaining it, of servicing your truck. However, if you break it and it's your fault, of course, you will have to pay for it. In addition to that, leasing is registered in the financial statements as an expense. Thus, your tax will be lower because usually you pay tax for the profit that you make and the higher the expenses, the lower the profits are. This way, the tax will also be lower because leasing is registered as an expense. On the other hand, for whatever you lease, you will never get full ownership over it. So if we are talking about the delivery truck, then you will use it, you will pay for it, but it will never become your property. So let's say the delivery truck is worth $50,000 and leasing is $25,000 a year. So if you use it for three years, then you will clearly overpay for this delivery truck, it's cheaper to buy the new one. That would be a disadvantage. Thus, the best situation when you want to lease an asset from another company is when you need some equipment in the short term. This way you will not overpay in the long term and this way you will not have to take care of maintenance. 
However, if you want to lease something and have ownership rights once you make the last payment, there is a source of finance for that and it's not included in IB Business Management course. It's called Higher Purchase. Higher Purchase is one thing that you might want to explore further. Microfinance providers are organizations that provide microcredit. Microcredit is really, really small loans, for example, $10, $50, really small sums of money that traditional banks will refuse to provide. Usually it works in less developed or developing economies. On the one hand, this source of finance really helps to alleviate poverty. In less developed economies, all people need is just a few bucks to start their business, but banks are not lending this money to them, so microfinance providers take the role of the banks and help to kickstart many businesses. In addition to that, microcredit is usually quite easy to obtain because you do not need a collateral for it. On the other hand, interest rates are usually quite high and you don't want to find yourself in a situation when your payment is overdue. So microfinance works really well in less developed and developing economies when businesses just need very small sums of money to kickstart their business. When it comes to microfinance providers, I have to talk about Mohamed Yunus. He is the founder of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and he won a Nobel Prize for his idea and his bank. I'm going to leave a link in the description to this video with a TED talk of Mohamed Yunus. Please spend 20 minutes learning more about how microfinance providers work and about Grameen Bank and about this wonderful person who created it. And the last source of finance is business angels. Business angels are people who are really, really wealthy, who are entrepreneurs and, as well, and who want to help some startups because they believe in their idea or they just want to help for some other reason. But even though there are no interest payments, business angels usually take some ownership over the organization that they are helping out. So on the one hand, this source of finance is free, there is no interest, you just get a bunch of money from a really wealthy individual. On the other hand, this really wealthy individual will become the owner of your company to quite a large extent. So this individual might end up telling you what to do and how to run your business. So you might lose control, potentially. This is clearly a disadvantage. This source of finance works really well for businesses that have high growth potential and that appeal, for some reason, to certain business angels. There are also some companies who are looking for companies with high growth potential and investing into them to maximize their investment. These companies are called venture capitalists. So venture capital is another source of finance that is not included in IB business management course. So please explore that if you are interested. On my website, I will keep all the links to all the additional sources of finance that I think you have to know, but that are not included in IB business management course. Please check out my website or my Instagram, where I will keep a note about these sources of finance. That's it about external sources of finance. I hope you filled in this table and now you know everything about eight external sources of finance that are included in business management course. If you want to know more, then I have another table for you, but you will have to explore it on your own. Again, you can use my website and you can follow the links there in order to explore these sources of finance more. If you would like me to talk about these eight sources of finance, please like this video, subscribe to my channel and leave a comment and I would be happy, absolutely happy, to create another video class where I'll talk about these eight sources of finance. In the meantime, here's a table for you to fill in. Good luck! In the last part of this video class, in part 3, we're going to talk about short-term and long-term sources of finance. But actually, we're not going to talk about anything new. We've already learned three internal sources of finance in part 1 of this video class, and we learned eight more external sources of finance in part 2 of this video class. 
In addition to that, I suggested you guys to explore eight more external sources of finance, because I think that would be really helpful for your future career. So, in this part of class, we're not learning any new sources of finance. We're just categorizing the ones that we already know into short-term and long-term, and are learning to recommend these sources of finance in different situations. So, before we begin, I would really like you to read this assessment objective justify the appropriateness of short-term or long-term sources of finance for a given situation. So this is what we're learning here now. Please stay focused on this assessment objective. First of all, let's try to learn to distinguish what is short-term, what is long-term. There is no agreement in literature about what's short-term, what's long-term, so whatever I'm saying right now is kind of average and does not apply to every single situation. It's a really nuanced question. However, usually, I repeat, usually short-term refers to one financial year or one fiscal year. It's the same as regular year, but it doesn't start on January 1st. It can start whenever, but it lasts for one year anyway. So if you would like to purchase short-term or current assets, these are assets that last for less than a year, then you will probably need short-term sources of finance. The common examples of short-term sources of finance are short-term loans, trade credit, overdraft, and retained profits. All these four examples, you can actually use these sources of finance and pay back for them within one year, which means that they are short-term. If you want to purchase some long-term assets that will last for more than one year, for example, some equipment or land or buildings, then for these kind of assets, you will need long-term sources of finance. Another name for long-term assets is fixed assets or non-current assets that we'll talk about further in Unit 3. So if you're purchasing long-term, fixed, non-current assets, you will need long-term sources of finance. Long-term is usually, usually more than one financial fiscal year. The common examples of long-term sources of finance are share capital, loan capital, leasing, and retain profits again. Retain profits, it depends on the time scale. It can be short-term and long-term. Also, there are some other sources of finance that we learned in part one and part two of this video class that I didn't put into any category because it's too nuanced. You have to look at every situation particularly and see if it's within one year or if it's more than one year. This way, you yourself will be able to make a judgment whether it's short-term or long-term. Okay, so now you know the difference between short-term and long-term sources of finance. Let's move on to the next stage. The next stage is appropriateness. This is actually what comes from our assessment objective, what we're trying to learn here, to justify the appropriateness of different sources of finance. So you know eight external sources of finance, three internal sources of finance, probably you explored eight more additional sources of finance, and you can categorize them into short-term and long-term yourself when you have enough data for it. Now it's time to learn how to make judgments about appropriateness of different sources of finance. The first thing you can do is, again, look at all these tables, this one, that one, and maybe, hopefully, this one. And works best at directly refers to appropriateness. Works best at is exactly what appropriateness is about. In addition, you can see pros and cons, consider the pros and cons of different situations, and recommend the most appropriate source of finance. But again, keep in mind that short-term and long-termness is a relative thing, and it depends on legislation, on agreements with the, between the lenders and the organizations, and many other factors. So, one-size-fits-all approach will not work here. You have to have a particular look at every individual situation. Another tip that I want to make is that one and the same source of finance can be short-term for some businesses, but long-term for other businesses. For example, retained profits. For smaller businesses, such as sole traders, this is more likely to be short-term. However, if we talk about retained profits of multinational companies or publicly held companies or huge multinational corporations, then their retained profits would more likely to be long-term sources of finance. 
And in addition to factors that we've already mentioned, there are some other factors that need to be considered when you make a judgment whether the given source of finance is appropriate or not. These are these extra factors. Availability, cost, control, time, gearing and risk. Availability. First thing you can do is just to see which sources of finance are available to you, to your type of business entity. If you are a sole trader, then share capital is definitely crossed off the list because you don't have any shareholders, you are a sole trader, right? Cost is another thing that you need to consider. Some sources of finance are free, but some of them need to be paid a fee or a commission or dividends or interest payments. Think whether the business will be able to repay for the source of finance before applying to, before trying to obtain the given source of finance. Control. As you remember, some sources of finance, such as business angels and share capital, might end up in loss of control. However, other sources of finance have nothing to do with control, such as bank loan. So when you are making a judgment about the appropriateness of a particular SOF to a particular business, then think whether retaining control is important or not. The next factor is time. If you're purchasing a short-term asset, a current asset, then you probably need short-term source of finance because you'll be able to repay within one year. If it's something that is needed for long-term, which is more than one fiscal year, then you will need a long-term source of finance. So time is also of the essence. And lastly, gearing and risk is one more factor. Gearing refers to the ratio between share capital and loan capital. Organizations can be high-geared and low-geared. High-geared organizations rely on loan capital more than 50%. So it means that most of finance that they have, more than 50%, is a loan. So this is considered to be quite risky and financial lenders would be more reluctant to provide funds to organizations that are highly geared because they already have a lot of loans and the chances that they will pay back are thus lower. Low-geared companies are the ones that rely on share capital on internal sources of finance more than on loan capital. Financial lenders will be more willing to provide loans to low-geared companies, but low-geared companies tend to grow slower. Less risk, but slower growth. So these are five more additional factors that you should consider when making judgments about appropriateness of different sources of finance. We've learned 11 sources of finance, 3 internal, 8 external, plus I encourage you to learn 8 more on your own. You can categorize them into short-term and long-term in any given situation using one-year rule, and then you can make a judgment about its appropriateness using pros, cons, when it works best column, and other factors that I've just talked about. I know that's a lot of things to keep in mind, but once you start practicing it, this should become easier, because practice makes perfect, as my favorite school teacher said. Now I will just say two more things. Now I will just say two more things and we'll end this part of video class. First, common sense is really important. You know all the factors, you have done a great research about sources of finance, but you should develop logic and common sense in order to make the most accurate judgment. Also, don't forget about gut feeling, your intuition. Sometimes it also helps a lot. And the second thing that I want to emphasize is that source of finance is not the same as revenue stream. We'll learn revenue streams later in Unit 3. For now, this is the source of revenue. This is different ways to get customers to pay for your product. Source of finance has nothing to do with customers. These are different ways to acquire money from different kinds of lenders. Source of finance and revenue streams are not the same. These are two different things. This is the end of 3.2 Sources of Finance. Please remember that this is one of the most important classes in the entire business management course. If something is unclear, make sure you talk to your teacher, you talk to your classmates, or you ask me a question in the comments below and make sure you get all your answers, because this is one of the foundations of business management. In addition to that, please have a look at the assessment objectives and make sure you achieved all of them. 
Oh my god, I almost forgot to ask you to like this video, subscribe, write comments and tell your friends about it. Whew.